Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Today we're talking about how long your training session should be. I mean, what is the optimal length of time to train your horse for? And it's a, it's a really, really important question. And it's one I think that is quite often misunderstood and we have a lot of beliefs about, you know, what this should be. And I think, I think it's a lot simpler than, than we often make out. So I want to talk a little bit first about the beliefs that we have. And, you know, as humans, we do things sort of in hourly things. We, you know, we, everything's an hour, you know, a lecture at university is an hour or 50 minutes or something like that. And we have a writing lesson, we have a writing lesson for an hour. You know, we, we're used to doing things in hours. And, and that's just the way we are. Unfortunately, I don't think our horses are like that. We need to consider a lot of different things when we think about whether or not a horse is up to having um, a training session that lasts an hour. So the first thing is the horse's ability to concentrate on something. Because quite often, the, you know, it's not, we're not just trying to get the horse fit. Like unless you're an endurance rider or, you know, a thoroughbred trainer, you're probably not trying to actually get your horse fit. So how long can your horse um, physically do something for? So you need to think about the horse's fitness level. The other thing that you need to think about is the, um, the mental fitness level of your horse. So how long can the horse concentrate for? And a lot of the time what we're teaching, especially with foundation training, actually requires a lot more effort from the bit between the ears than it does from the muscles in the horse. So just, we're really just talking to the horse's brain and, and that's what we're training. And I often say that, you know, I'm only training the bit between the ears. You know, I can, with a small horse, I could maybe push it around and muscle it around a bit, but it's not actually gonna help me much because what I want the horse to do is I want the horse to understand what I'm asking it to do. So it's very important that we only work the horse as long as the horse is able to concentrate because once the horse has lost focus then it's game over really so that's you know i think that's that's a major problem and it's one of the things i find you know when horses come to me horses often come to me or people come to me when they get their horse back from the trainer so they've you know sent this lovely horse off to the trainers to be started under saddle this is really really common and it comes back and it's got all these really bad behaviors. They don't often come out for a week or two, but pretty quickly they, they do come out. And the difference usually is, is that the trainer who's been you know, under pressure to get a job done in a certain number of weeks or days or whatever, however long it was, has pushed the horse very hard. So the horse has actually ended up being quite tired by the time that new learning comes in. So it's been run around the round pen or it's been lunged or something else. So it's quite tired. So it no longer is asking those questions. You know, it's no longer saying, well, do I have to do this? You know, maybe I don't. Maybe if I bark or run off or rear, then I won't have to do this. So what's happened is the horse actually hasn't learnt much. It's, um, it's been muscled through it. And it's the same thing if we look at an off-the-track thoroughbred horse. So beautiful horses, but they haven't learned much that's useful for us as pleasure riders. So by that, I mean, you know, they've been pushed, they've been muscled into doing things. So for example, you know, when, you, when they're loaded into the barriers for, to start the race, you know, quite often you'll get a couple of people behind them. They're basically pushed into the barriers. When they're bridled, they often have their ears twisted and their head pulled down to be bridled. When somebody gets on board, you can see them in the saddling paddock, the jockey's throwing up while somebody else leads the horse around. The horse is never taught to stand still to be mounted. So they're muscled through things. And what happens in the end, at the end of the day, they actually haven't learnt these things. So they haven't been taught the simple cues, the simple cues like stand to be mounted, put your head down to be bridled or self-load into the trailer or the starting barrier. They haven't been taught these things, they've been muscled through. The same thing happens when you send your horse out to a trainer that guarantees you'll ride it for an hour a day um, with a horse that isn't physically fit enough to be able to do that. There's very few horses 
that will be physically fit enough to be able to do that. Because what usually happens is we basically leave our horses in the paddock until they're of an age to start, three or four or five, and we send them off to the trainer for six weeks or so. And we expect the trainer to be able to accomplish all of this and work the horse for an hour a day. And it just, it doesn't work because what happens is the horse gets sore. So immediately you're introducing pain, discomfort into the equation. And that is gonna make the horse very resentful, of course. Um, and so, you know, this is why I suggest that you actually start much smaller and you actually start by engaging the brain, not training the muscles. So when I was in India recently, um, I, it was fabulous because I had about 10 horses to work. And I also had some lovely girls there that were lining the horses up for me. So I didn't actually have to go anywhere. But I've been saying for years and years now, the best amount of time to work your horse for, if you really want to make progress and you've got an educationally young horse and an unfit horse, is 15 to 20 minutes twice a day. That's what I always say this, you know, that's what I've found when I work my own horses. But I've really been in a situation where for a month, I've been able to do that every day, day in, day out with 10 horses. And so it was wonderful to see the way it really worked when I was in India. Now, these were all very educationally young horses. There are also horses that have just been out in the paddock, you know, like all horses have. Um, and so they're also very unfit. So it was very interesting. What I found, one thing that really stood out to me was because we would work early in the morning because it was quite hot and we'd rest during the day and then we'd work again early evening. And the horses were actually lining up after that. You know, they were really keen to come back and do more, which was great. And it meant, you know, to me, it told me they're not hurting, they're not bored, you know, they're not resentful and all of those sorts of things, which is so important when you're training horses. And by just sticking to that 15 to 20 minutes and not overworking the horses, like none of them, despite the heat, you know, I think I needed to shower down a horse like once or twice. And that was a horse I'd actually been riding, you know, rather than working on the ground. Um, and so probably been for a little bit longer than the others, but you know, they weren't, they weren't being worked into submission at all. We were actually engaging their brain. So this is why I start with the engagement zone, getting the horse into that bubble of communication. And why I think it's so important to start there. Let's just take, for example, um, you know, the, the first thing I always teach is the give to the bit. So that's the softness in the bridle, it's the frame and that sort of thing. The reason I teach that first is because it engages the horse for me. It really gets the horse thinking and gets us both into that bubble of communication. So we're on the same page. And from there, I can take the horse um, to other places. From there, I can get the feet to move in the direction I want them to go and I can make it pretty and do all of that too. So what we're really doing is we're building automatic behaviors. Now, I just had a meeting with my Eat Ride Love group. I run a um, rider health and fitness course as well. And, um, and we were talking about this, we were talking about willpower. And willpower, as you know, we, we know, is, it's like a muscle. And so you can use it, but it gets tired. So if you're on a diet, for example, and you're using just willpower on your diet, that's great. And you'll probably make it through most of the morning. You can keep making decisions based on willpower. Um, but eventually, certain by the afternoon, you get tired and you've used up all your willpower muscle and you give in. And, you know, for the horses, it's the same. We can't have them being mentally tired. We can't have them, you know, keep deciding that they're going to do what we're asking them to do. We need to keep it short and keep it fun and keep them engaged. And that's why the give to the bit works so well to get the horse into that engagement zone. The give to the bit is simply a pressure release exercise. So it's a small amount of pressure on one side of the bridle and the horse gives to that, we release it and praise the horse. So it's using positive and negative reinforcement together as most horse training is. And 
the horse starts to respond to us. We start to build up this sort of communication and the horse then concentrates on us and what we're asking it to do. One of the things I find, especially with young horses, is that with all horses, they can only think about one thing at a time. And so we need to be careful that that thing is what we want them to be thinking about. If the horse is hurting, it's going to be pain. Pain will always rule. So if you've got a saddle on a horse that doesn't fit, that's what it will be thinking about. It'll be thinking about its back hurts. If, um, if you're asking the horse to go fast, that's something that will kill it. So it, you know, the horse can't keep going fast for a long, long period of time. The horse can't go really fast all day. So this is another problem I find with young horses is that we often expect them to um, have a really good quality of gait. Like you'll often hear people say, oh, you know, you need a good working trot with that young horse. You know, he's not tracking up, get him tracking up. And well, that, that is important, but it's not important yet. We need, what we need to do first is engage the horse with learning, get the horse soft and round, and get the horse to understand the basic cues. First of all, softness and roundness are really important. The reason is, is because as soon as the horse rounds up and lifts his back up, he can elevate his shoulders and he can get his hind quarter underneath him. But we want the horse to be soft in the bridle. We don't want to have to pull the horse in front and push it up behind because that makes a, a very difficult to ride horse, a very uncomfortable horse, and it creates a lot of tension. So we've got to start with relaxation. We can't get the horse to relax if we're pushing it forward fast. Like if we keep trying to get the horse in a good working trot, then the horse is going to concentrate first and foremost on speed because speed will kill it. However, if we say we let the horse jog, and it is easier to train some things in jog or in trot than it is in walk. So having that extra bit of emotion by lifting the, um, the speed a little bit, if we can train th something like this in jog, then it's much easier and it gives the horse the opportunity to concentrate on the lesson and to focus on relaxation rather than the speed because the horse can jog for a lot longer than it can trot. So, or trot in a working trot anyway. So I think that's really important. I always say the first thing to do is get relaxation. And the next thing is to get the feet to move. So, you know, you might start getting relaxation by just moving the head and neck with give to the bit, the lateral, bit of lateral bending, not too much. And don't move the head right around. Just a little bit of lateral bending to get the horse used to pressure release because we're going to be using pressure release all the time. So, um, so that, that's a good place to start. So we start with relaxation, then we get the horse to respond to pressure release. So we open that line of communication now. Then we get the feet to move and then we take them in the direction we want them to go. So then, so once we get moving, then we take them directional control. So then we're looking at the shoulder control and the hind quarter control. We get the feet to move in the direction we want them to go. The last thing is we make it pretty. So for me, pretty is quality of gait. Um, and that, that's the main thing I think about then. You know, I think we overcomplicate things quite often. And we, we start with too much. So let's say your goal is to do a prelim dressage test with your young horse. Great goal, what a good idea, you know. I think the thing to do is for you to learn the patterns, you know, for you to teach your horse how to ride, or for you to learn how to ride a 20 meter circle, for example, how to um, ride each quarter of a 20 meter circle. So you need to have that in your head. For the horse, you need to teach the transitions and you know the walk trot transitions, the trot canter transitions, a nice square halt, that sort of thing. But the horse can learn most of that in jog. You know, the horse really doesn't need to be powering over the arena for an hour a day to learn that. The thing about trot as well is that a slow trot, a jog, is a great training pace because the horse really can do it all day. So, you know, it's, it's a really good training pace. It's more emotional than walk, 
but it's not so emotional as to take the horse's focus away from the job you are doing. The other thing about trot is that trot is a very difficult pace to ruin. You know, um, walk is a really easy pace to ruin. And, you know, if, you, if you've got a dressage horse, you'll, you'll know this. It's actually, if you do a lot of things in walk, you actually can get a lateral walk quite easily. I remember in, when I was living in um, the States and I was riding um, an ex-Olympic horse every morning and because it's, it, its owner was at the stables and she said, you've only got one rule. She said, if you walk, you have to do it at the buckle. You're not allowed to hold the reins when you walk. Any, any other pace, I don't care what you do, but the walk, you leave him alone in the walk. And that's because it's so easy to ruin the walk. The trot is, is not. I mean, the trot is really easy to improve. But all you have to do if you're working in jog, and a lot of dressage people go, oh, I can't work in jog because, you know, the dressage judge will tell me that, you know, it's not forward enough or it's not a working trot. And of course they will. I'm not suggesting you do the test in jog. I'm suggesting you train the horse in jog to conserve its energy. As long as it's a two-beat pace, it's still a trot movement. Okay, this is when you need to be careful is when you start slowing paces down. So the walk goes lateral quite fast. You have to be careful of that. And the canter goes four beat quite fast as well. So you don't want to slow that down either. That's what makes trot such a great pace. Trot is easy to improve. There's a lot of things you can do with the trot to improve it. You can put trot poles out. You can, um, you can practice extended and collected trot and things like that. And it's a very easy pace to play around with and that, what, what makes it such a great training pace. I really like to teach all my horses to jog from the, the thoroughbreds to the quarter horses. The, they, they all have a good jog. And it is amazing the way you can keep relaxation and keep focus in the jog. I think the thing to remember is what we're doing is we're building automatic responses. Okay, so right at the beginning here, if you're training or retraining your horse, if you're starting or restarting your horse, or you're just coming back, you know, you've got a horse that perhaps has a few holes in its training, a few issues or problems, then you want to think about it all as automatic responses. So for that, I mean, any of these foundation training things should become automatic. And it's something that we don't have to give a lot of thought to. Now, we have a lot of automatic responses, such as get up in the morning. Get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you know, you have a shower, you drive to work, you make your coffee. You do all of that sort of without thinking about it. And that is what we're building in the horse with these basic responses. So give to the bit, the first one. You know, you get on, you pick up the reins, the horse's automatic response to that is to go into frame to be soft and to be in the engagement zone. You then start to move the reins and use your legs and the horse has automatic responses to all of those simple cues to move body parts around whilst remaining in that bubble of communication in that engagement zone with you. Now, as we know, to build habits, which is what we're doing, automatic responses are habits, you don't actually practice them for an hour a day. Like you don't clean your teeth for an hour a day just in the hope that, you know, tomorrow you'll get up and do it as an automatic response. You practice these things regularly for short periods of time. And that's exactly what we're doing with the horse. So once you've built these automatic responses in your horse, then you take it to the next level. And then of course your horse is more fit mentally and physically more fit. And so therefore more able to progress with the training. So once you've got you know, an automatic response for your shoulder control, we were talking about this the other day where uh, you know, what is shoulder in? Well, shoulder in is just the first step of a 10 meter circle being ridden down the long side. So your inside rein is holding your shoulder um, just off the track and riding down the long side. So we need that automatic response to where the rein is to control the horse's shoulder before we can get independent hindquarter control, which is the outside rein lifted, 
which engages the hindquarter, which will give you Trevet or Hontrazine. So it's, you can stack these automatic responses on top of one another. We have to start right with the basic thing. We have to start at the beginning with getting the horse relaxed into the engagement zone, into that bubble of communication. And I do that with a simple give to the bit work, which um, does all of those things for me without tiring the horse out. What happens if you, if you skip the give to the bit work and you go straight to you know, the horse in a, in a good working trot, but you also, you want frame and you want self carriage and all of those things, you end up having to fight with the horse. The horse ends up very tense and resistant because it's, um, it's way too much for the horse to think about and the horse is concentrating on that speed. And so you, you didn't start with relaxation, which means you're gonna have to end up with a lot of hand, a lot of um, rein pressure, and a lot of leg pressure as well to get that, to get the same result that you wanted. So by actually making it easier for yourself, by cutting down the time that you're spend, you spend training, you actually make it much easier for the horse and therefore um, a much more pleasurable experience. When I was in India, I, I was just blown away by the speed with which these horses came along. And there was a lot of them were orphan foals, which, you know, we all hear orphan foal and we go, oh, oh. and a couple of them, you know, they, one in particular, a little horse called Ariel. And if you look at my blog, there's some um, meet various horses and meet Ariel. Have a look at that. She was so cute. I just, I kept seeing her in the, in the field when we were working other horses. And I said, oh, let's work that one. And the, uh, the owner of the uh, refuge said, oh, oh, I don't know about her. You know, she's a bit you know, crazy and um, she just jumps on you and walks all over you and all of this sort of thing. And I thought, oh, she's so cute. Though. So we got her in and sure enough, um, you know, the first session she did jump on me and um, stepped on my foot. And she's not very big, but anyway, that was quite funny. But so we only, I think she only got two weeks work. So about, about 14 days. And she was amazing. And at the end of it, we had a little rider on her and she was trotting around. She looked like a little show pony. So, so soft in the bridle. We had two different lunge reins. One had a heavier clip than the other. And so she kept giving to that one. <laughs> she was so light in the bridle, beautifully in frame, beautifully in self-carriage and just completely different horse. And, you know, by the end of that, very first session right at the beginning she jumped on me at the end of that very first session which was 15 minutes long at most you know we had we had the start of give to the bit she she had a first bridle on and she was so engaged with it it was absolutely wonderful and we often feel don't we that you know the horse doesn't want to train the horse you know would rather be standing in the paddock and I think we need to be careful about putting our feelings onto our horses because you, I think you can turn that around. I always say, I'm sure that the horse wants to train. You know, I'm sure that the horse is really eager to train because it's so much more interesting than standing around in a paddock. And when you train like this and you get the horse relaxed and into the engagement zone, the horse gets praised a lot. Like if you're doing give to the bit, I mean, the horse gets praised hundreds of times, positive reinforcement hundreds of times during your you know, 15 minute session. And so the horse gets more and more confident with each short session. What happens when we take an educationally young horse and an unfit horse and overdo the training, like train for too long, either 30 minutes, an hour, anything like that, is the horse ends up either mentally tired and or physically tired and or sore. So as soon as we introduce pain, it's game over. You know, the horse then comes to resent training or hate training because it hurts. And that's absolutely fair enough. And I was having this conversation with somebody the other day, actually, about saddles. So had In the gold membership, uh, quite a few people are getting new saddles. And it's really interesting because, you know, we're so careful, aren't we, these days, so careful about fitting the saddle to the horse. And I remember when I was young, we used to get the saddle that fitted us and we used to just put that on the horse. I don't know how we survived, I suppose <laughs> we didn't survive that well. Um, 
but now we, you know, we are very careful about making sure that the saddle fits the horse. And I think it's another problem with sending your horse away to a trainer for starting is that most trainers still these days have one saddle that they use as their breakout saddle or rough out saddle. It's the same saddle. They break every horse in, in this same saddle. I'm like, well, that's not going to fit every horse. We're not going to come close to fitting every horse. And so what happens then is you've got a saddle that's not fitted to that particular horse and the horse is being worked for a long time in that tack. And I think it is a recipe for disaster. And it's basically the reason that I started the online training is because, you know, I was so tired of seeing these horses come to me that had been, had already been to a trainer you know already been to a trainer and it's come back and now it does x y and z and i don't know what to do and i just thought it was so sad because these horses you know it's just unfair on the horse to to put it through that and also you know as an owner I wanted to be able to empower people to do these things themselves. You know, we, we think about starting a horse under saddle or retraining a horse and it can seem a little bit overwhelming, but I think we overcomplicate that. You know, I really do. I think we need to come back and think about, okay, what does this horse need to know? It was the other thing I was blown away with in India was, we saw, you know, had a lot of foals and, and young horses there and um, just how gentle they are. You know, they are such gentle, gentle creatures. And it's what we do to them that, that makes them aggressive or defensive, you know, and it's often the way that they're treated during this starting process. And, you know, I think it's really important that we work with the horse and so i do encourage you to to break things down and to shorten your training sessions and really work on engaging the brain that bit between the ears is the bit we're training not the muscles at all not till much later much later great you know when you want to go off and start competing and go endurance riding or whatever it is you want to do yeah let's get the horse really fit but until then let's train the brain so that is it from me for today, um, unless you have some questions. Does somebody have a question? I'm allowed to talk. Asa, do you have a question or? Um... No, I think your hand is up, but I'm not sure why. Oh, here. So, says Kate, I have an older horse, well-schooled. If I'm schooling this afternoon for a more upbeat canter, more jump and exercises to have a working canter, ask for more energy, return to working trot, working canter, then ask for a short canter, a few strides. How long should I train this for? A few minutes, a couple of circles. Um, I work on long rain, walk, trot and canter and ask for this exercise by finishing long rain. It's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic question. Um, yeah, so you're asking about how long you should you should train this canter, and she wants more jump in canter mm -hmm. and and more energy in canter. So yeah, if you've got the horse on the long range, definitely start it there. Um, I would, I mean, canter is a really energy expensive gait, so you want to you want to make sure that you're. Um, not overdoing it, obviously, which you're obviously really aware of. I also put a verbal cue on it. So you started on the lines and um, I use the same thing um, for trot as I do for canter. So for trot, I use a cluck and for canter, I use a kiss. But basically to get more energy, um, I, I use that as a sort of slow cue. So it'd be a or with the trot, it's a and and I keep that same verbal cue and then I stop it. So you, all you want to focus on is that you're getting a transition. So you're getting that transition within gate. So you're seeing a change in the canter um, back and forth from asking for more energy and then returning to the working canter. Yeah. So, um, well, for a few strides, you might need more than a few strides. You obviously, if you're schooling your horse, in canter, you've got a reasonably fit horse. Um, 
and so yeah look I, I certainly wouldn't do more than a few minutes at a time without resting the horse I think that's really important um, that you you know do a few circles ask for more energy and transition back to a working canter you know maybe three circles where you make that transition a couple of times and then change sides you know with it maybe a walk between or something like that great question thank you Um, Robin asks, uh, do you find giving them a day off helps? And enormously, I mean, <laughs> hugely. I, it's, yeah, it, it's really interesting. And, and I also found that in India too, because a couple of days we went off to Uti and, and did some other things. I had demos and things like that to do. So, yeah, they, they always came back um, better after a day off and more eager as well. So yes, definitely, I think giving them a day off helps. I think we worry too much about working them every day. I really do. I, I think they, they've got great memories. Um, I think time off doesn't do them any harm at all. I think they not only retain what we teach them, but they actually get more relaxed with it as well. So, you know, I used to always say that if you teach a horse a lesson, so a well-learned lesson, and then you throw the horse out into the paddock for 18 months and don't touch it, um, if you bring it back after 18 months, it will ret have retained 80% of that lesson. Now, this is whether it's a good lesson or a bad lesson. This is whether you taught it to load really well on the trailer or you taught it to rear. It doesn't matter. It will still remember 80% of the lesson. I think it probably is even more than that. I think it might remember 80% of the lesson and, and, you know, add another sort of 10, 20% um, which, with what it's thought about. So, yeah, I think they retain information very, very well, which can work for us or against us, of course. But definitely time off is not a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry, you're, I've got your name down here as Asa, but we're back on the, um, the canter question. And she's just replied to me um, saying that she doesn't do much lunging, it's mainly riding. And that's fine. Do the same exercise riding. I wouldn't do the exercise lunging at all. I mean, if, you do, if you're long reining, do a long reining. Um, but I, I think lunging ends up with more problems than it solves, to be honest. So um, I'd avoid lunging, uh, do it under saddle or do it on long reins. Brilliant. Oh, hello, Sue. <laughs> Sorry, it comes up as your computer name. You have an Acer computer. Um, I guess it's not good to repeat the same exercise too often. Um, no, I mean, I think, yeah, I think the thing is that we need to work out when the horse has it, when the horse has understood it, and, and when the horse needs more repetition. And, you know, I think we probably repeat a lot more than we need to. So that's something also that I've come to find is that, you know, I used to say with Give to the Bit, for example, that you need 300 good repetitions a side, per side, left and right, to really get the Give to the Bit with the horse. And I actually think, I think it's a lot less than that. Although I think it depends a bit on whether you're just training the horse or whether you're untraining or retraining the horse. So if you've got a horse, let's say you've got an off the track horse and you're teaching give to the bit. Well, first of all, you have to untrain a whole lot of stuff. So it's all so new to that horse because the horse has been desensitized to pressure. For the off the track horse, pressure means go slow, go fast, stop, turn. And pressure just means everything. And it's unrelenting. So it never goes away. It doesn't really matter what the horse does. It has to just put up with this pressure. So these horses are really desensitized to pressure. So we have to resensitize them to pressure. So that's sort of untraining first before you actually get to train. So that horse will need a lot more repetitions than a horse that's never had a bridle on. Um, like the horses that I found in India, you know, never had a bridle on. They're like, give to the bit. Mm, you do five on each side and they're like, yep, I know this. Here, and you leave me alone. <laughs> it's really much easier. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, let's 
I think it's important that we don't bore them. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good point, Sue, from New Zealand. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, I think I think that's it for me uh, for today. Um, I will hopefully see some of you in the gold meetings um, or the Eat Ride Love meetings. Otherwise, I will see you here next week for our Monday morning webinar. Thank you all very much. Bye.